Life is beautiful. Give a warm air conditioned welcome for the incredible Kristen Ulmer. Hey girl, Thank you. Hi. I have a very important message for you. I used to do the same thing that everybody does around the subject of fear, which is try to conquer it, overcome it, fight it, let it go. And I became so good at doing this that I became famous for it. Unfortunately, it almost ruined my life. Turns out it's actually really bad advice. It took me 20 years to learn that. Hopefully it'll only take you 15 minutes to learn it today. Here's my story. I became famous in one day. I was a skier. I wasn't a very good skier. I competed in mogul competitions. Mostly I came in last place in mogul competitions. But I was really good at one thing. I was good at talking this cameraman, this cinematographer that made ski movies, into auditioning my skiing for his movie. And so he invited me out to Squaw Valley. I drove all night to Squaw Valley and was met in the morning by six very well-sponsored, super famous skiers that I had seen in the magazines. I was blown away. They take me to the top of Squall, Squaw Valley, you know, Squaw Valley. There's a cliff band at the top there called the Palisades. And uh, I get up there and I see the scene unfolding. These guys, one by one, started jumping off these cliffs and throwing the trick of the day, which was a back scratcher. And I thought, well, okay, clearly, if I want to get in this movie, I have to jump off one of these cliffs and I have to throw a back scratcher. Now, I had never jumped off a cliff before. I had done a couple of little jumps here and there, man-made jumps, and I'd never even seen somebody jump off a cliff before, and I had certainly never thrown a back scratcher. And for those of you that are not skiers, a back scratcher is when you try to touch the back of your skis in between your shoulder blades. So I pick one of these cliffs, because that's what it's going to take. And it was a 30-foot cliff. And like I'd seen the guys do, I told the cinematographers my plan. And I backed up and counted three, two, one, and off I jumped. And this actually, whoops, there it is. Hey. That's, First time, a 30-foot cliff, landed it, skied away, great, and uh, went up, did it two more times. Well, unbeknownst to me, back then, no girls had ever done anything like this before in the world. So by the end of the day, everyone in Squaw Valley knew my name. By the end of the week, everyone in the ski industry knew my name. And Within three weeks, I was fully sponsored, salary and all, and I had reporters calling from all over the world calling me the best woman, big mountain, extreme skier in the world. So here's the question, though. In my story, you notice I didn't even mention fear. You know, where is the element of fear in this story? There's a lot to be afraid of. I'd never jump off a cliff before. 30 feet is really high. And back scratcher and all these famous skiers were there. How, how come I didn't feel fear about that? All these, this fancy camera equipment. And the reason why um, I didn't feel fear is because I just didn't. I had never felt any fear. My whole life I had never felt fear. Uh, it was just not part of my daily experience. And so it was like the perfect storm for me to become a professional skier. Never felt it. And the reporters were almost more intrigued by my inability or, or, or the conquering of fear than I, they even were in the skiing itself. And so next thing you know, I get better and better. I started jumping off, oh, 70-foot cliffs. And I started throwing front flips and back flips, which at the time, no girls had ever done that before either. And I started doing really crazy things, like I rode my bike alone across India, and I snuck into Tibet to try and climb and ski the sixth highest mountain in the world uh, alone, with no experience, illegally. Because <laughs> I was fearless, right? And I took up a lot of really dangerous sports, like rock and ice climbing, paragliding, kiteboarding. 
And as a result, I got voted by the outdoor industry to be the most fearless woman athlete in North America. <laughs> and uh, and I, I um, was really proud of this, too. But I started noticing that things just felt a little off, like there was something wrong. The first indication that I had that there was something wrong came with my first injury. I blew my knee out. Of course, in skiing, there's a lot of injuries, knee injuries being the most common. So I blow my knee out, and instead of feeling horror, I mean, it was kind of a gross accident, like knee in a blender moment. Instead of feeling denial like most people feel or horror, I actually felt relieved. Relieved. It's like, okay, now I finally get to spend six months on the couch, thank God. And I also um, felt that there was just something off, something missing. Like I'd, I'd ride the chairlift and I'd look at my skis and I'd think, this is, this is wrong, there's something wrong here. I felt like I was wearing a mask. I didn't feel like I was living an authentic life. And I started to be really burnt out on skiing too. And really burnt out. Like, all my friends would be so excited that it was winter time and ski season was about to start, and I'd kind of feel this dread. I'd pretend that I was excited, but my career lasted for 15 years. Twelve of those years, I was considered the best in the world at my sport, and every article that came out about me called me fearless. But I was getting to the point where I actually hated skiing, and hate is a very strong word, and it's not inappropriate inappropriately used here. I hated skiing. So finally, I couldn't take it anymore. And I had gotten to the point where I didn't even have to ski anymore. I was writing uh, columns in magazines around the world. I was hosting my own television show. All I had to do was show up at the parties and drink a can of Red Bull, and I'd get paid. You know, I didn't have to quit. I didn't even have to ski, like I said. But I could not take it anymore. And so I quit abruptly. And then some other things started coming out. Like, I, I realized I didn't like who I was. And I felt really judgmental against everybody else in the ski industry that were making a living as professional big mountain extreme skiers, or just extreme athletes in general. You know, where was that coming from? And I also had PTSD. I don't think people really realize how dangerous these sports are. I had witnessed several of my friends die while skiing. I had witnessed probably, oh, 40 or 50 uh, career-ending, life-changing injuries and accidents. And I myself had had probably 40, 50 near-death experiences where I was fighting for my life. And I had all the symptoms of PTSD, which comes from traumatic experiences and the not willing to feel the emotions behind it. That should have been a giveaway. And I also had uh, adrenal fatigue. I got diagnosed with just flatline cortisol levels. And I, I literally spent the next 10 years sleeping. I was just exhausted. I spent 10 hours a night sleeping just to be able to have the energy to go to dinner with a friend, and then that would be all I could pull off in a day. I'm like, what is going on here? I couldn't figure it out. What was wrong? And finally, I met a Zen master. You know how the story goes. And he asked me the most important question of my life, which was, allow me, please, to speak to the voice of fear. See, in Zen, you're considered a 10,000 faucet diamond. And you have all these different aspects to who you are, fear being one of them. And he wanted to speak to my voice of fear. I couldn't find it. I was so good at repressing fear of locking in the basement and throwing away the key. It was just buried. And uh, he started teaching me about fear. It was just an amazing experience that, you know, fear, your relationship with fear is one of the most important relationships of your life. And if you weren't even willing to talk to it, and, and, and all I did was repress it, you know, it's just, it's like repressing your, your very life force or yourself or, or just hating yourself because fear is such a huge part of who you are. He taught me that, uh, <laughs> Uh, fighting fear, it's, uh, it's like declaring war on a primary part of yourself, and it's an unwinnable war that gets carried out in your unconscious mind. It's absolutely unwinnable. He taught me that 
Whatever you try to control winds up controlling you. Whatever you repress becomes your repressor. And so it started to explain a lot of things that were happening to me, like why all the injuries? And you know, my injuries never really healed too. I wound up having to have seven knee surgeries to recover from that one injury, even though I never re-injured it again. And I had a, a lot more injuries too. And um, you know, it explained the burnout. Like if you're fighting this unwinnable war, you, know, you, don't, you don't have energy left for anything else. Whatever you repress becomes your repressor. So the question comes up, does a beautiful life include fear? And the answer is yes, absolutely, it does. It does. And I want to reframe the way that you see fear. And so I have a couple words here. First of all, we all know that it keeps us safe. You know, that's a given. Like, look both ways before you cross the street. But there's some other things that we don't realize about it. Like, the wisdom that fear has, which has been around since the first, you know, single cell amoeba, I mean, what is that, billions, trillions of years ago? Like the wisdom, the innate wisdom that fear offers us is unmistakable. It's also the source of creativity. Like I watch The Voice, I love The Voice, American Idol. Like what do these, uh, these coaches always say? They say, the emotions are the most important thing. I know in ballet, they consider the emotions more important than technique. Like we get that emotions are so important for creativity in, in uh, sports and, or, or excuse me, I, I believe it's the most important thing in sports, but in the creative arts, um, sculpture, painting, singing, dancing, all that. But it's also the most important part of your creativity in your life in general. Also, motivation. I mean, fear is one of the greatest motivators we have. I thought I was fearless during my ski career. It turns out my ski career was entirely motivated by fear. It was just working covertly and I couldn't see it. Like, I had a fear of not being special. I had a fear of not being loved, of, of being invisible. But I'll tell you what, you jump off a 70-foot cliff and people love you and you're no longer invisible. I know Bill Gates was motivated entirely by fear of failure, and look at what he's done with his life. So I became really also well known for skiing, you fall, you die descents. And imagine standing at the top of a cliff knowing if you fall, you die, and I mean, what's gonna take you into that place of the zone? And what, it turns out that that's what fear does. It makes you feel so alive. It, it gives you such clear vision and, and takes you into the present moment. Like, picture for a moment Bambi in a field eating grass, and all of a sudden her innate fear just shows up with a spike, like, oh my gosh, what's going on? There's something wrong. She looks around. There's some rustling in the bushes. All of a sudden, she's just more clear and present and in the moment than she was when she was eating the grass, and there's a tiger. And so little Bambi takes off and the tiger's chasing her and, and she's, she runs faster than she ever has in her life. She's more powerful than she ever has been. It's all because of fear. Now, I hope Bambi survives this story, <laughs> but do you see that actually fear was what took me into the zone and little else does? Fear also is what makes life interesting. I have people come to me all the time saying, oh, I, I want to have less fear when I'm skiing. I'm like, well, why would you want to do that? The reason why people spend thousands of dollars to go on ski vacations is to feel fear. Imagine for a moment what life would be without fear. It would be really boring. And I know people that go to Paris and they see the Louvre and the Eiffel Tower and all that. And then the last day, they get mugged. And they come home, and what do you think they tell all their friends about? <laughs> about the mugging, right? It's like fear is, is whenever there's fear present, you know things are, are really interesting. Fear also expands who you are as a person. Like, if this is your comfort zone, you know, every time you go out of your comfort zone, there's fear involved. You are going to experience fear. And so you do this enough time, connect the dots, and all of a sudden you've expanded who you are. So if you're willing to feel fear, it'll expand who you are bigger and bigger. Fear is also tied in with accomplishment and a confidence. 
however much fear you feel before something is in direct proportion to how good you feel about yourself afterwards. So I ask you, if you want peace in your life, if you don't have peace around fear, which is such a primary part of your life and who you are, are you really living in peace? If you want to live in a state of freedom, if you don't allow fear, the freedom to do its job in your life, are you really living in freedom? If you want to have compassion for yourself and others, but you don't have compassion for fear, which is such an innate part of who you are, can you really pull that off? Can you really have compassion for yourself and others? And then the big one, too, fear offers you balance. You know, balance is not between uh, happiness and joy. You know, balance is between opposites. Fear is an uncomfortable feeling. So the balance between discomfort and comfort offers us perspective. So I just hope that what you're going to take from this is that it's time to make friends with fear. It's time to, we're done conquering it. Make friends with fear. I promise you it'll be the best thing you ever do. I even, even uh, am having a love affair with fear at this point. And uh, because of that, it's taken me a long time to get here. I now actually love skiing again. Thank you.